are speaking to Steve Olson, uh, owner uh, of the West Bank Cafe, which housed the West Bank down the West Bank Theater uh, downstairs, and now called Lori Beecham Theater. It, growing up, do you remember your first time, first plays you saw, or the first? Yeah, my grandmother, like I said, was a uh, uh, a matron in the uh, Mark Hellinger Theater. Uh, the first play uh, now was, a church, isn't it's it? It's now the uh, I believe it's the Times Square Church. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, the show I, my brother and I saw. I think I was ten and he was eight. It was My Fair Lady. Uh, after that was The Sound of Music. And we saw all the shows in the Mark at the Mark Hellinger Theater. The Mark Hellinger mm -hmm. theater. She'd walk us in. Uh, I remember one time. I think it was Fade Out, Fade In. Where we went to the uh, Playland Arcade before the uh, theater and bought a big bag of popcorn, and we're sitting in the orchestra eating popcorn. <laughs> and uh, you know, unbeknownst to us, they don't sell popcorn in Broadway houses. And you know, it created a little bit of a scene in the in the uh, in the uh, orchestra uh, seating area because uh, uh, you know we'd be noisy and we were like eight and ten years old. You know. uh, it's a vivid memory, but yeah, we saw anything that uh, that was in uh, the Mark Hellinger Theater, we saw as kids. When do you remember first developing an interest in food or restaurants or wine? My, or? my uh, four uncles, uh, uh, the Gleasons, uh, my Uncle Joe, John, Tom, and Bill, uh, in 1966, uh, they drove out to the World's Fair in Flushing Meadow when it was when they were breaking it up, were breaking it down, and they had a letterhead from the Rheingold uh, Beer Company, and they went to the they had a lot of beer pavilions at the World's Fair, and uh, Rheingold was one of them, and they they uh, rented a truck and they drove out to the World's Fair and had this letterhead, uh, and they yanked the bar out of the pavilion. They stole the bar out of the Rheingold Pavilion, drove it over to 75th Street, New York Avenue, and installed the bar and uh, established T.J.W. Gleason's Tavern on York, established 1866. And uh, they were on the cusp of going out of business, and then Esquire picked up on it and uh, did a big uh, story about these four guys. Uh, and the tavern, the true tavern tradition continues, and uh, and the place just became a gold mine. When I turned 15 years old, uh, prior to that, I was uh, an assistant superintendent when I was 14, when I got my working papers uh, for the uh, garden apartments across the street from where we lived in Pagoda, mowing lawns and cleaning the uh, uh, the laundry room wiping down the machines. When I turned 15, uh, I had called my Uncle Joe and asked him if he had a work job for me. And uh, he hired me as a dishwasher. So on Sundays uh, mornings, I would take the bus from New Jersey into New York and uh, over to 75th in New York, and I was the brunch dishwasher. Uh, which meant there was a three compartment sink, and I was washing my dishes, the dishes by hand. Uh, I did that for a year. I loved it. You know, I liked making money and, and uh, having my own spending money. Uh, and I, I just enjoyed the work. When I was 16, uh, I came to work one day and my uncle said, uh, uh, the cook is gone and now you're the brunch cook. And I said, great. And he, I said, who is my dishwasher? He said, you're your dishwasher. <laughs> So the cook was gone, and I actually did brunch for about 70 people uh, by myself, and then washed the dishes. Uh, so that was my promotion without a raise when I was 16 years old. When did Manhattan Plaza go up? Manhattan Plaza, I, they first occupied uh, the, the uh, residence apartments. They started moving in residence. The fall of 1977, maybe the late summer, uh, as the apartments were becoming finished, uh, they were moving people in. I uh, signed. I was the first commercial tenant to uh, sign a lease with Manhattan Plaza, 
and I signed my lease in January of 1978. Uh, the store fronts hadn't been finished, so I signed a lease. I signed a 20-year lease. I was 23 when I signed it, and um, and it was two grand a month uh, for 20 years. Um, and when I opened the restaurant on June 29th, 1978, I was 24 years old. And uh, uh, like I said, the Citibank, uh, actually Citibank opened up uh, right after uh, I opened up the West Bank Cafe. And what do you remember about, neighbor? tell us about the neighborhood in 78. Well, <laughs> um, it was pretty bad. It was notoriously bad. I think it was uh, worldwide famously bad. Um, the uh, it was the Forty uh, Second uh, Street was the uh, was a raunchy had a raunchy reputation. Uh, it was the uh, porn capital uh, of of the world. Uh, it was uh, there were hookers and pimps. And uh, Johns, and uh, as the cops used to call them, street urchins, uh, in the whole neighborhood. I, the few customers we had, uh, were afraid to come in. A lot of times, they were afraid to leave because they thought they were going to get mugged. I would, I would, I, I would uh, look outside and watch. Playwrights Horizons had opened up uh, just, be here. just before we were here. Theater Row was under construction, so the theaters were not uh, occupied yet, but they were already, they had tenants going in, uh, but they hadn't started, you know, doing shows yet. The playwrights had started doing shows. I used to watch the patrons, the audience, running into the theater and then running out of the theater. And because you couldn't get a cab, nobody would, a cab wouldn't pick anybody up in the neighborhood. They just would disregard anybody waiting for a cab. They were afraid to pick up uh, passengers. But we didn't. I didn't care because I was so excited. I uh, got my restaurant open and and, uh, and thrilled to be in business. And you know, and uh, and not doing well at all. The uh, the stores adjacent to the restaurant. Uh, on either side, uh, didn't rent for the first five years. I couldn't pay my rent, uh, but I wasn't afraid of being evicted because I knew I was the only tenant in the building, me and Citibank. So they, there was never a threat. The landlord was great. Irv Fisher from HRA, he built it on uh, as a uh, with his group of partners, and he was always very, uh, very uh, supportive. Uh, encouraged me to hang in there, and, uh, and it was very kind uh, not to uh, try to evict me, although I think he knew that it didn't make any sense to, to soap up my windows because when he couldn't rent the stores next door. Uh, eventually, uh, the theater row opened. And you had this space in the basement from the start? There was uh, one partner. Uh, actually, John from St. John, he was a partner as well. There were four of us. Uh, so, and by the way, the uh, the general contractors. It was it was the two general contractors. It was John Bernard and me. And uh, uh, I we when I when I signed the lease, uh, like I said, there were no other uh, commercial tenants in the building. And in fact, there were no walls up. So the storefronts were placed in place. There was no wall between. There were no you walls. And we could see Ninth Avenue. You could see the pad back of the panels on Ninth Avenue in, uh, uh, to the east, and to the west, you, know, you could see where the garage uh, cinder blocks were. And there was no way to get downstairs. You'd have to leave. Actually, you could walk right through the back, and the rental offices weren't even built yet. Uh, it was just wide open. So, I claimed the basement and a half. Uh, I said, can we get an extra space downstairs uh, in the basement? They said, sure. So, we had the, uh, the, store, the store upstairs, the 2,400 square feet. 
and I got a 5,400 square foot basement. And uh, one of the early shows, uh, we didn't do shows for the first year because uh, John Bernard was dead against live entertainment. So we're not doing live entertainment. Uh, if there's no money in it, it's a loser. We are not doing it. Uh, after the first year uh, that we were open at the West Bank Cafe, John left the business. He, he uh, uh, left St. John's and he left here. And the day he left was the day I started building out the field. Well, he said, we're not going to do live entertainment, but were you doing anything with that basement? or no. just we were framing it out. Uh, and, uh, and, what, and, were and the early, just, what were the early plans for it if it wasn't going to be there, live entertainment? We, I, More restaurants? There was never a conversation about it. Uh, I remember... There was, a, there was a yellow linoleum kitchen tile floor put in the space. We had a drop ceiling with some high hats, and that was it. It was uh, There was air conditioners in the ceiling as well that came with the uh, store. Uh, and for a year, we uh, we, didn't, we didn't do anything with it. And like I said earlier, maybe I didn't, but we were losing from the time we opened about $3,000, $3,000 per week with a very, very small payroll, couldn't pay the rent, nobody would come to the neighborhood. Uh, it's this, a lot of money. You know, when you're 24 yeah. years old, you, you feel invincible, and, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was a lot of money, and, uh, you know, it was scary. Uh, but, you know, nobody came to the neighborhood. We were pioneers, and we were very, very early. Um, so the day John left the business was the day I uh, decided to build at the theater. I remember when I had to pick an identity for our location, and my choices were either at Manhattan Plaza or on Theater Row, and I decided that we were on Theater Row, and uh, a message was sent to me. To, from, to, to advertise. Yeah, no. like West Bank Cafe right. on Theater Row, to try to create an identity yeah. and a location. And then, and then I was uh, informed by uh, someone uh, that was uh, one of the founders of Theater Row that we were in fact not on Theater Row on that day. Theater Row was uh, the south side of 42nd Street. To which I responded, I said, look, if a butcher opens up or a barber, it should be the barber or the butcher on Theater Row. If we're all part of the community, uh, nobody's stealing anybody's thunder by it. I think the more people know about Theater Row, uh, you know, the more popular it's going to become. And, and, uh, and don't forget, at this time, nobody wanted to come to the neighborhood. You know, it was Siberia all day. And then I got approached by uh, uh, Rand Forrester, who uh, just graduated uh, the year before from, uh, from the Yale Drama School. You know? And uh, I knew Rand uh, through the Manhattan Punchline uh, Theater. And he had been uh, uh, working over there in a uh, uh, kind of a house manager uh, position, I guess. And he came to me and said uh, uh, he would like to uh, the opportunity to start booking shows downstairs. He had a group of uh, actors, writers, and directors that uh, were classmates and, and others that he knew uh, that uh, may want to come down and, and start doing one-act plays. From Yale. From, so from Yale. Friends of his from Yale. A lot of Yale students, uh, yeah. And uh, I said, well, at, at that point I had uh, been burned a bit and uh, kind of okay. took my lumps and lost money. Uh, on shows and and uh, you know, don't forget every time we started up a new program, whether it was cabaret or jazz or or uh, rock, we'd have to you know get new stationery and and uh, and sort of recreate the room and spend or operating expenses. We'd have to uh, uh, bring about just to uh, to relaunch a program. And I said, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm interested. But we're not going to spend any money. There's no budget for this. Uh, and I said, uh, I need to see what you're what you're thinking about, what you're talking about. 
So he he called for a meeting downstairs, uh, and about 50 people showed up, uh, actors, writers, and directors. And uh, Rand pitched the idea to all of them uh, about having, possibly having the opportunity to book this room, and uh, the, you know who would be interested in coming in and doing plays, or writing plays, or directing, or acting. And everybody was enthusiastic. About it. And Louis Black was in the audience. I had met Lou a couple of times. Uh, he actually did a uh, a benefit at the front at the uh, uh, for uh, for the uh, Manhattan Punchline Theater before they got uh, tossed out of Forty First Street. I thought he was pretty funny. He did some comedy, but he was really a playwright. So at the end of the meeting. Uh, I, I agreed that we can, should move forward with this, and uh, gingerly, cautiously, but that he could start booking plays. But uh, yeah, we started out with an aggressive, uh, very no budget, but you know, a lot of phone calls. We put together a newsletter on the cheap. Uh, if if we uh, for a lot of shows we didn't have an audience, uh, we'd do a phone campaign. Casey, you got to come down and see this show. It's right up your alley. Uh, we need an audience. Come on down. We weren't charging anybody. It was a suggested five dollar cover, but just to, we just basically wanted people to see the shows. Uh, it wasn't really uh, a, a uh, designed as a revenue uh, source. It was an extension of who we were at the restaurant and an extension of what was going on on Theater Row, and it worked perfectly because the performers and the playwrights and the directors were all working across the street and around town doing shows. We also uh, never held auditions. So if a writer came to us, or an actor or a director with a project, we'd read the project and uh, we'd say, okay, we want to do your play. Is it cast? Do you want us to cast it? Is it cast? Is it Tell us what we need to do to get it in here. And most of them were cast, and most of them, the actors that uh, came in with projects, they were coming in with projects for themselves, and their friends were writers. Uh, we never held auditions. Uh, we would call people and offer them parts uh, if, if we needed to cover a part. Uh, it was great. It was a place, Lewis once said to me, this is great, it's a place to fail. And me being, you know, in the free enterprise system, didn't like that at all. I said, no, we're here to succeed. He said, no, I mean, it's a safe place for performers because they can get their work up and they can see what it looks like and then they can um, uh, come back and fix it, you know, or abandon it or whatever. Uh, so it was actor produced, essentially. And then, like I said, after that, we started doing one acts. And we were up and running with the one acts. I felt we were totally connected with Theater Row, uh, the restaurant, and, and the, the theater operation downstairs were shining. And we were like a real sort of uh, uh, industry known uh, place to hang out and get your work done. Uh, we started getting, uh, there were a lot of unknown uh, performers uh, and playwrights and directors that came in here that uh, had long established careers now, such as... Who were some of them early well, on? Aaron Sorkin, we did his first two plays, uh, Hidden in This Picture and Oregon, uh, were his two plays, uh, and, uh, and we ran those a couple of times. and. Uh, uh, Alan Ball uh, had a comedy troupe called uh, Alarm Dog Rep, and Alarm Dog, Alarm Dog Rep uh, performed here off and on for like three years or so. Uh, those are two. Uh, Warren Light uh, was an, uh, a writer, is a writer. He was uh, tr fooling around with comedy. He was thought he'd uh, try to break into stand-up. And Warren would come in, and his stand-up act was, uh, and he'd do it at the free show. And his stand-up act was basically his story, which is growing up the son of a jazz musician. And he'd talk about how different it was. He'd say, for instance, 
when you're going to bed at night, your father's tucking you into bed, he's got a tuxedo on. And then when you wake up in the morning, he's, you know, he's loaded at the breakfast table with his ashtray filled with cigarettes, and you're off to school, and he's just getting in. Because after the gig, you go out with his friends and, and play all night at these you know, these jazz clubs. And he also talked about uh, in his act, uh, he say uh, he called his old man up to tell him he had his first writing gig. And uh, you know the jazz players are always classic underachievers. They they get a gig and they coast on unemployment, you know. And he called his old man up and said, uh, I got my first writing gig. And his father said, great, how much? He says, two grand. He says, you're set for the year. You know? <laughs> and that was his, uh, uh, it was, he was very funny, uh, but uh, he went away and actually wrote a play, which we called Sideman. And he came back and, and we produced, presented uh, Sideman uh, Many times over the first uh, over a few month period, in different forms. In different forms, as he's developing the play, and um, and then he uh, and then it went up to uh, Vassar, where New York Stage and Film took it, and then it came down, and uh, and then it opened on Broadway, and uh, and it won a Tony Award. Uh, I was very, uh, very proud of that show uh, that we, that it started at our place, it was conceived at our place, and written and experimented here, and then it won the Tony Award. At at one point, uh, Actors Equity they weren't finished with me; uh, they were just starting uh, with the stomping at the Savoy. Uh, we started like I've been talking about now, doing the one acts, and. Uh, we, we, all, the the members of Actors Equity were sent. We were sent to cease and desist order to stop uh, hiring actors and stop doing plays. All the uh, uh, the union members of uh, of Equity, the actors, they received cease and desist orders, so keeping them out of here, saying. If uh, that if they worked here, uh, they would be brought up on equity charges and possibly uh, kicked out of the union. Uh, on its own, on on their own, they sent letters back to equity saying, with 90% unemployment in our industry, uh, if your intention is to protect us from the West Bank Cafe, who's going to protect us from you? Because Everything that came in here was actor produced, it was uh, playwright produced, it was director produced. This was an opportunity to work on your craft. As Lewis said, as we said earlier, a place to fail and come back. And uh, so, Actors Equity sent Zelina Hussein, and Zelina Hussein uh, was uh, Alan Eisenberg's. Uh, assistant. And Zelina Hussein was actually sent in to shut us down. Uh, and when she saw what was going and oh, by the way, uh, when I was brought up on charges originally, I went in front of this board, uh, they were uh, concerned because I had a bar. And they thought that the bar was a money maker. <clears throat> and I invited them in to 10 bar. I said, you could come in in 10 bar and see just how, how it does. Uh, which was, it was just there as a convenience. There was never a minimum. Uh, there was no requirement to spend money other than a suggested door fee, which a lot of the times we just waved that to get an audience. And when Zelina came in and saw what we were doing and it, it enjoyed what we were doing and actually saw how little business the bar was doing, uh, she understood what our what our uh, mission was, and went back to actors equity and said, "I think we should work with these people." And Zelina and I hammered out what was the first of these equity waiver. Uh, they're common in Los Angeles now, where actors are trying to keep themselves busy working and working in these equity uh, waiver productions. It started here with Zelina Hussein coming up with the idea and hammering it out and me 
uh, putting my two cents into it as well. And so that allowed us to, uh, when they got the feedback from their constituents that people weren't complaining about working here, they were trying to work here and trying to get produced and trying to get seen by agents and trying to, you know, get rep and, uh, you know, be discovered, which a lot of them were over the course of, uh, just by the numbers, you know, the thousands of people that worked here. Uh, in, during that period. So we were able to uh, 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 have an agreement, with, with a friendly agreement with Actors' Equity, uh, have their, encourage, their permission to operate, and, uh, and, and thanks to Zelina Hussein. Uh, so it was pretty slow in 1998 uh, in terms of doing shows, and I decided to shut it down and renovate the theater. We were going to, uh, my budget was 45000 and uh, I ran into a friend of mine on the street, Gene O'Donovan, who owns Aurora Productions, he used to be Neil Mazzella's partner in uh, Hudson Scenic Studios, they built sets. And when I told uh, Gene I was shutting the room down to renovate, he said, what's your budget? I said, 45000 he says, a paint job. <laughs> so. I called my friend Neil Mazzella, the owner of Hudson Scenic. Uh, he was married to Lori Beachman. Uh, Lori Beachman was a friend, aside from knowing Neil, I knew her separately originally. Uh, Neil was one of my best friends, is. Uh, I have a group of them, and he's, he's certainly one of them. And uh, the owner of Hudson Scenic. And I called on him and I said, I really would like to uh, spend some money on this and, and renovate it and uh, I need your help. And uh, he said, I'd be happy to help. So he brought in uh, David Peterson, who's a set designer, works for Robin Wagner. And uh, Hudson Cena came in, and we gutted the room, and, uh, and we uh, put in new air conditioning. Uh, we expanded the room a little bit. David uh, uh, Peterson uh, is a set designer. Uh, Neil's company fabricated all the, the fine finishing. Uh, they, they, uh, it was a Hudson Scenic job. They, we put a custom ceiling in. We brought in a new theater lighting package. Uh, we brought in David Wiener to do the light design. Uh, Kurt Wagner came in and did the uh, residential, you know, the, the, uh, the, the uh, house lights. Uh, it was a labor of love. It lasted about. It took about a year and a half to do it, and it came in at four hundred fifty thousand dollars, including the piano. Uh, up to that point, we had rented a piano from Carol Music on a month-to-month -month basis. It literally had two legs. We had a milk crate underneath, underneath one of the legs for like eight years. And when I called Dennis Curry from Carol Music and said. I'm buying a new piano, you can take yours back. He said, keep it, it's yours. <laughs> I think we spent 18 grand on the rental. And uh, so we, we, we were building out this uh, beautiful uh, new space. Uh, it, it, was, it was a fantastic experience. And in the middle of it, Lori Beachman passed away. And it was a very sad uh, time for all of us, because Lori was a... Uh, was an occasional singer, you know, with us. She was a Broadway star uh, and had done a lot of albums and she married Neil. She'd been sick for a long time with ovarian cancer and uh, not expected to live more than a year and a half and she lived actually nine years and lived a full life. Um, I remember when Lori telling the story, telling me the story when she first got diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. She called her girlfriend and said, uh, I have stage four ovarian cancer. I'm never gonna do another board, be able to do another Broadway show. I'm never gonna get married. I'm never gonna see Paris. And then five years later, she called the same girlfriend up and said, uh, I gotta call my husband and tell him to cancel a Paris trip because I just got a Broadway show. So she really packed it in, uh, made every day of every minute of her life count. And, uh, and married Neil, and in the middle of our renovation, she passed. And uh, up to that point, uh, the, theater, the space was called the Downstairs Theater Bar, and then eventually we dropped the bar and called it the Downstairs Theater. 
and uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about Lori's passing, and uh, and we decided. I decided after this conversation that we would name it after her. I called the Lori Beachman Theater. Uh, Lori was afraid of being forgotten and being erased, and I thought, well, this would be just a way to keep her uh, memory alive. Uh, and as Lewis said, it also kind of uh, raises your expectations because you had such a gift that uh, you expect something great to be going on down to uh, measure up to uh, her stand. Uh, Lou was a little uh, upset, uh, disappointed because he thought I should name it after him. <laughs> the Lewis Black Theater. And then finally he said, how about if we just call it Lewis Black Presents the Lori Beachman Theater. <laughs> but uh, honestly, he was very happy with it. And uh, little did any of us know when we named it after Lori that it would take on a life of its own. Because when we reopened the space uh, in 99, a couple of months after she passed away, uh, with a new look and a new identity, uh, and we started doing more music, uh, it, it, it was never our intention for for it to be anything but the West Bank Cafe, and then you go to the Lori Beachman Theater. But it took on a life of its own, and it, now it's well known as the Beachman or the Lori Beachman Theater. So it actually turned out correct because her memory is preserved, and uh, everybody in town knows the Beachman Theater. Uh, of a loyal uh, clientele here. I think our food is as uh, good, if not better, than it's ever been. Uh, you know, it's, I'm dedicated uh, to being here and, uh, and operating the restaurant. We have a huge, uh, very, very large number of uh, return guests. And for me, the shared history, uh, when I opened, I was 24, and now I'm 61. To see all the people that have shared their lives with them, and, 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 and you, you with them, and them with you, as people have grown in their careers and changed careers, some people, um, so many people came out of the theater downstairs that went on to have a television career, movie career.